name is Kevin and I collect old irons. This is actually the tenth of our videos in this series, done over a three week period during the summer of 2020. I'm hoping before the end of the summer with other projects also that are ongoing to, um, to have about 20 of these representing 20 basic categories of antique pressing irons represented here in the collection of the Old Iron Inn Bed and Breakfast in Caribou, Maine. The plan from there is that I hope that I will have opportunity to visit some of the other collectors and that we can do additional videos from those aspects, categories, or specifics that are not well represented in this collection. One of the reasons that the topic of old irons is interesting is the diversity and I hope you already starting to appreciate that those that have seen some of the videos up to this point in time. That diversity I think is equivalent to the entire diversity in say guns or in cars and when I say cars I mean all cars, from race cars to pebble cars. From guns, I mean the entire diversity of guns from revolvers to blunderbusses. There is that diversity amongst the irons. However, there is not the knowledge and record of that diversity is found in the other categories. Um, there is endless numbers of books about not just guns but the particular diversity of a certain group of Colt revolvers perhaps or in cars of Ford Mustangs of a certain portion of that history whereas in irons there is that diversity but it's not well documented it was not necessarily well documented as these things were made um, there are very few collectors who are collecting and building, preserving the individual artifacts and that record is much more difficult to get access to. And that is, I think, well expressed in one of the categories we're talking about today. Today we're talking about irons, actually of two categories, both of which are elongate, longer by a wide measure than they are wide. These being the sleeve irons and the uh, and the seam irons. And for the sleeve irons, we're talking about a very common group. A common group that was in its day uh, probably manufactured by most nearly all foundries within the country. And yet that record is not necessarily well preserved. So let's start with the sleeve irons here. Um, I will start with this iron. This is a blacksmith iron. It's all made by a blacksmith, a sheet of metal and a blacksmith handle on top of that. All these irons, even the simple ones, have records that we can, we can figure some things out and at least frame some hypotheses as to how it was made, where it might have come from. Carol Walker, who I've mentioned in a mentioned before, a very famous collector, uh, assembled quite a collection of these. She was from Texas. This iron also comes from Texas. Um, we might look at this and remind ourselves of an iron that we saw when we looked at flat irons. This was the so-called slave iron with the bell within the handle. By the way, very similar in general appearances here. Um, I think that these irons, I almost said are from Texas, but I would be incorrect, I think, if I said it that way. I think they are from a portion of the landmass now occupied by Texas. I think these are, these are Mexican. I think the irons found in Texas probably predate the establishment of the Republic of Texas in the 1930s, 1830s, I'm sorry. Um, it would be very interesting if we were to find a 
collector from Mexico who actually has a collection of Mexican irons can tell us if these irons are within a subset of Mexican irons. Um, I think that is part of the history that this iron may, may have for us. Let's take a look at another blacksmith iron. Blacksmith irons are, are not well documented and, and not really avidly collected because well, because there are no markings on it. They, um, they do not have the patent dates. We know very little about them. Uh, this particular iron was found in an antique shop in central Maine. I do not know its history. Um, it is obviously blacksmith. It's of a regular, irregular, but elongated shape with a, with a, a roughly made handle. Um, this may have been made by a local blacksmith in a small community in Maine, perhaps for that blacksmith's wife, perhaps for somebody in the neighborhood who, who requested some particular device for the, the clothing that um, presumably she might have been, or he could have been a tailor, um, ironed in that community. So an interesting iron about which I know very little. With that, I have here a handful of, um, of sleeve irons. Sleeve irons are elongate uh, more than they are have a width to them. Uh, these have uh, lengths of uh, five to six and a half inches. I'll refrain from metric equivalents at this moment. Um, they have uh, each one of them has a different kind of base, different kind of handle, different kind of posts than the other. These two relatively small, this one a little more robust. They do get longer than the ones that I'm showing here. And that's about all I can say for these. Um, none of these have markings. Now. Uh, my guess is if you were to focus on this group and collect these things at the expense of anything else that you had room for, my guess is that you could have hundreds of sleeve irons of different bottoms, different handles, different bases. Um, by the time you assemble that collection of hundreds, you'd probably be getting a fairly good idea of some of these that have similar handles, posts, bases in particular regions. Maybe you could trace these back and even come up with a good idea of, of where that foundry that made those particular irons might come from. But we don't have that knowledge. And unfortunately for the sleeve irons it's hard to get that knowledge because these irons, what they have in common are very typical of cast iron sleeve irons is that there is no information. There are no even numbers that we would commonly find on a, uh, on a cast iron flat iron. There is no company names, there is no patent dates, and that is because these were, these were applied utilitarian irons um, that every foundry did, but in terms of showcasing their name and all those particulars, they do that on a larger iron that may have been part of the set here. Um, you don't have a lot of space up here, and so that time was not given, and we don't know where these came from. One of the reasons why I think the sleeve irons are largely underappreciated um, and undercollected, perhaps, um, those of us who document irons, as I am an example, have not spent a lot of space and a lot of time in our collections on this particular group. I will show you one cast iron sleeve iron for which I at least can say something and the top of the handle here says WAPAK, W-A-P-A-K. That is a, a foundry, not a foundry particularly known for for the making of sat irons but for making skillets and um, waffle irons and various sundry ca other cast iron products um, but made sleeve irons as well. I have here a Waypack 
Uh, small flat iron has a 2 on it. I'm not sure if the 2 is an inventory number or a weight. This one says weight pack with 14. I do not collect weight pack irons. I just happen to have um, these within my collection. It is worth saying that there is quite a uh, community of people who collect uh, cast iron. I'm not sure about the status of the weight pack um, collector's community, but I know it's there because I notice on eBay that some weight pack sat irons have a bidding that takes them to higher prices than I would think sat iron collectors would ordinarily pay for this. Again, there's the weight packer community as well, and that is true for the, uh, the skillet and uh, cast iron manufacturers in, in general, uh, Griswold being particularly famous for the, um, the uh, motivation of the collectors within the group. I do have one sleeve iron in my collection for which I actually have a, um, at least amongst the cast iron collections here, for which I have a manufacturer and a patent date. This is from the Sweeney Company. This is a Sweeney iron. Looking down at the top, it says patent July 19th, 1899. Um, very uh, interesting shape in that the sleeve iron here has parallel sides. Perhaps that is what the patent is for. It also has a um, very nicely done handle. This one says number six on the top. And I do know that these come in multiple sizes because I've seen a couple, three different sized sleeve irons of this particular group. So here is an unusual sleeve iron. It does have a patent date and the particulars. And with that, we're finished with the cast iron sleeve irons. I do not have many because I do not see the markings and things that have motivated me to spend money and, and time for those. Um, but we have a sense for how common sleeve irons were in, um, in the community and in the, amongst the manufacturers by what we see with the, in the detachable handles. Um, all of the major companies that made detachable handled irons made sleeve irons. We've seen a couple in the detachable lecture. I think we had an, an Ober and we had a asbestos detachable handle iron of the sleeve category. This is, as you I hope appreciate it, Mrs. Potts handle. And let's take a look at the top of the um, base here. It says Grand Union Tea Company. There are many different Mrs. Potts style sleeve irons, but this is by far the most common. Grand Union Tea Company. The Grand Union Tea Company was uh, one of the first chain stores, a uh, chain store in the way that, that, that Walmart or, or Target is. Um, the first stores, which were then widely disputed, distributed in, in communities around the country, uh, Grand Union Tea Company had uh, 200 stores in the, in the middle of the latter 1800s. Uh, going up to 500 to 1,000 in the 1920s. I understand there still are some Grand Union stores in the, in the country. So uh, when you do find a sleeve iron, this may be very often the sleeve iron of the Mrs. Potts handled type that you're likely to find. By the way, this particular iron um, I picked up when I was in high school. Long time I've had that one. We've also talked about the sensibles, and here's the sensible handle. This is a sensible number five. These things do come in multiple sizes. Um, and I got something else to show you. Let's move that here, and we'll bring this in. This is something that's particularly odd. One of the, one of the things that interests me in my study of irons is the transitions from one technology to another. And when you're dealing with a group as diverse as irons, you see those transitions. And they're always interesting, interesting to study, just as they are for, for guns and cars. Uh, this is 
a electric sleeve iron. I have the electric cord associated with it. Um, with essentially a sensible base and removable handle. Uh, quite interesting because I can't think of any reason why this should have a removable handle. I can, I can take the handle off, but the only way I can actually remove this is unplugging the, the electrical attachments, in which case I have the handle over here and I have an unattached, maybe hot, uh, base. Interesting. Um, this is, I, I'm not sure exactly why this was made this way, but it might have been simply because the electricity is a new technology, an intimidating technology, and maybe for somebody just starting to get familiar with this technology, it would be more comfortable to have the base in a shape that you relate to very easily. This shape. By the way, I also like this iron uh, particularly well because it has the word Pluto on it. Being a science educator, uh, having a, uh, a iron that is named after a planet um, is interesting. This is from the Consolidated Electric Appliance Company. Uh, 1907 patent date. So with that we've covered briefly as is our want to do for each of these groups the sleeve irons. We are in this video going to do two categories. The second category also long and narrow is the seam irons. The seam irons are sort of the opposite in a sense. We have very little um, variety, not very many examples. It's a very minor category, though it is a category of, of some particular interest to the iron collector. And the seam irons are, let me start by saying that there are among the tailor irons, especially the blacksmith tailor irons, there are irons that are very long and narrow. But they probably were used for multiple purposes, seams maybe being part of that. We're covering here uh, some irons that are explicitly designed for seams. That is, where fabrics are joined together, sleeves, most particularly perhaps the seams of pants. These irons are designed to be very narrow while also being very heavy to actually press on those seams. Um, this is the uh, Elvis um, iron from Springfield, Ohio. So I do have a company, do have a location. Um, the, again, it's quite large, quite tall, uh, but also quite narrow. And this is typical of a few of these. These are rather unusual. This particular one, fairly simple and one could probably acquire for something like maybe a hundred dollars, which is a lot of money when you consider that the tailor irons or the sleeve irons in general would only go for about twenty dollars a piece. This is a second uh, seam iron. It's actually labeled on the one side as seam iron. On the other side is Modeste. Um, they do have other markings as best as I can tell. These are American. And uh, there is a very narrow surface that would be in contact with the fabric and yet the iron itself is bulbous to give it that extra mass. Uh, there's a mass to the handle as well. This is a surprisingly heavy iron. Um, we can talk a little bit about values here. Uh, again, the sleeve irons themselves, uh, none of those irons I showed, except for maybe the electric iron, uh, should cost you more than $20-$25. Um, this iron is rare and it's unusual enough that it's sought after by people who are collecting and want to have something in this category. I was lucky to get this one in, in, um, on eBay for about $100, but uh, at a specialty iron auction a few months ago, one of these just sold for $750. Now, I think that price was very, very high, but it also had apparently a couple of very motivated bidders who bid that up into stratospheric levels. 
Uh, we'll talk in other videos about how to, uh, how to manage bidding at auctions. And what you do is you set your prices ahead of time and you, um, and you go up to what limits you think they're worth. And if you don't get it, that gives you money that you can put to something else that's further down the list. We're finished with these two categories. Uh, we're going about to move on to some categories that I have a particular interest in and much larger collections of the hat irons and the fluting irons, for starters. And I hope that you will uh, keep with me so we can talk about those.